Well, good morning, church. It's so good that the weather is just starting to heat up a little bit. I got my sandals on today. Um, And I don't know exactly how your week's gone, but I want to start out with a scripture to encourage you as we start this service today. Isaiah 46.10. Only I, God says, only I can tell the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. God is in control. He's here with us now. Let's give him our very best this morning as we worship him. How you guys doing today? Good morning, Crosswinds. How you guys doing today, man? It's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. We serve a God that is amazing. We serve a God that is glorious. We serve a God that is awesome. We are so gracious to be able to praise his name this morning. Amen? All right, we're going to go ahead and start with our first song. Let's go in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this morning that you've given us. This is an opportunity for all of us to worship you together. And so, Father, we surrender our mind, our heart, our body, our strength, every part of us, Lord. Lord, we even surrender those areas of our life that's not lining up with your word. And we confess, God, that we've sinned against you. We want to have an encounter with you this morning, God. 
So we humble ourselves before you. We pray, Spirit of God, fill every spot where we're meeting. Strengthen your church today, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes 100% fixed on you, for you are worthy. And we worship you now, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, again, it's so good to be meeting with you this morning, church. If you're brand new on the place where you're on the church online streaming page, click I am new and let us know a little bit about yourself because we'd love to make a connection with you. Each week, we're reminding you, church, about our life groups. In fact, I just met this last, uh, I think it was yesterday, I just met with all of our life group leaders, and they are excited about what's going on in our life groups. And so make sure on Church Online, make sure to click on I'm interested in groups if you're not in one already, because we'd love for you to have the same joy that we're experiencing in life groups. Uh, This week, a few things I wanted to highlight to you is uh, the cafe. We are at the finish line. We are so close to being done, and there's a lot of hard hard work that's gone into uh, making this project successful. If you want to join in and you want to help out, if you got a little extra time on your hands, we'd love it and we'd appreciate it. Make sure to send an email and let us know about it. There should be some information on your screen. Connections team, we're meeting online at 10.15 a.m. on Sundays. We met this last Sunday, and we had a great meeting. In fact, we met today. We had a great meeting. And uh, all about connecting the church, connecting us to what God's doing on Sunday mornings. We share an inspiring story. We pray with each other, and then we share on social media what God is doing. Hey, make sure to text CONNECT to the number that you see on your screen. We'd love to see you there as well. Uh, We're giving a weekly reminder to Helping Hands. Uh, As far as I saw, the unemployment rate is at 14.7%. That is a a crazy number. We want to make sure that everybody in the church is taken care of. That's like the advantage of being part of the church, that we know we can have that same attitude that Jesus had that said, don't worry about tomorrow. So Helping Hands, if you find yourself in a need in this this season, we want to be there for you. If you want to help out because you have a little extra, we want to make sure to have that happen as well. Helping Hands, you can find that on Church Online. Uh, Mother's Day, we're doing something special on our Facebook front porch and Facebook living room. On the front porch, we'll have just a fun, uh, special video for moms. On the uh, living room, this is an opportunity for you to interact and show some honor to your mom. And we'll be seeing that roll out this week. So make sure you join us on Facebook and see what we're doing for moms. And speaking of Mother's Day, since it is Mother's Day, we want to honor one of our spiritual mothers here at Crosswinds Church. For the last 25 years, uh, Bonnie Borden has been the director of our women's ministry. And uh, she's going to be retiring from that position. Now, don't worry. Women's ministry is continuing uh, stronger than ever. Uh, But uh, it's time for Bonnie to step down, and she's going into different areas of ministry. And when I think about Bonnie uh, and the, the 30 years that I've known her. Her and Dick and the family have been here for as long as I've been here. Uh, It's just uh, been a tremendous uh, experience Mm -hmm. to know her and to minister alongside her. I I think of Proverbs 31. Many of you know that in Proverbs 31, we have the description of of a godly woman. And verses 25 and 26 really, I think, describe Bonnie. It says, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. And uh, Bonnie has been a tremendous influence in my life, particularly 16 years ago. She didn't know this until I just told her this recently, but uh, she was very instrumental. Some of her advice to me when I was considering whether to become senior pastor of this church, uh, it was directly related to, the, the decision to say yes was directly related to some things that Bonnie had spoken into my life. And so we truly appreciate her. The staff has put together a little thank you uh, video and let's see that now. Hey there, Bonnie. It's been an honor to serve with you these many years, and I especially appreciate the impact you've had on the women in my life. I look forward to many more years together. Bonnie, I just want to thank you so much for serving the Ladies of Crosswinds. You talked about the widow who Uh, shared her last meal with Elijah and through her obedience to serve how she was supernaturally cared for. That's what I think of when I think of you. So thank you for all you do and may God abundantly bless you. I just wanted to tell you 
how much we appreciated all the hard work you put into women's ministry in the past years. Good and faithful servant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bonnie, so much for all of the work you put in for the glory of God, for the women of Crosswinds. I bet you when we get to heaven, you're going to be sitting down, drinking tea, coffee with ladies, countless ladies who have said, this is how God used you in my life to make a difference for eternity. Thank you, Bonnie, for all the years of sacrificial service, your love for God, your love for us, and all the things that we have learned about being unified as women, serving the Lord. Again, thank you, Bonnie, for all your serving and keeping people connected to the church. We want to make sure that during this time we do stay connected. Uh, you can do that on the app. You can do that on Facebook, uh, YouTube, our website. We have these outlets, so let's make sure, church, we stay connected during this season. And lastly, I want to say thank you for everyone who's giving uh, financially to further the mission of God through Crosswinds Church. Uh, and we just say, you know, continue uh, making that financial contribution, your tithes and offerings, and you can do that by clicking give on Church Online. Bless you guys. Let's continue to worship our God. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall, but you have never failed me yet. Yeah, waiting for change. Still they
so faithful like the sun that shines each and every day he is so faithful and his word will come to pass
there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up so love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should accept him will have everlasting life. Things we do for love. You know, uh, down through history, people have done some pretty wild, outlandish things for love. Uh, you, if you go to Greek mythology, for instance, there is this gal by the name of uh, Helen of Troy. You know, she was a gal that uh, uh, was captured or was uh, stolen away from her husband uh, and was and was and taken off to Troy. And uh, okay, you know, I'm going to start over because I forgot the story. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's right at the beginning. Uh, King of Sparta. Okay, Prince Paris of Troy. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, the things we do for love. You know, people do some amazingly crazy things at time for love. One of the, one of the craziest, even though it's Greek mythology, is the story of Helen of Troy. Uh, she was considered to be the most beautiful woman of all time. She was stolen away from her husband, and because of that, the, uh, the, the Trojan Wars actually began. She was known as the woman who, uh, whose face launched a thousand ships. Thousands of men lost their lives because of the love for this woman. Well, let's talk about something that's real. That would be the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal was a, uh, a structure built back in the 16th century, and it cost nearly a billion dollars in today's dollars to build the structure. It was built by the emperor for his wife. 
And uh, imagine doing that for, your, uh, for, for love. I think of that and I think of something that's a lot less expensive, uh, an experience in my own life. I decided back in the early or the mid-1970s that I wanted to get this girl by the name of Jackie Hillman, who later became my wife, but I wanted to make a grand gesture, and I wanted her to go out with me, and so I I came up with this really uh, nice-looking date that we would go on. It was a date down to uh, Los Angeles to see a musical, and I wanted to ask her out in a way that would help to ensure that she would say yes. And uh, one of the things I always had going for me was my voice. You know, I could sing, and it kind of melted her heart when I sang to her, and she even had some favorite songs that I sang. So I decided I was going to do that, and I went to the bank. She worked at Valley Bank here in Sunnymead, and I went into the drive through of the bank because she was working the drive through And I went there to, uh, to ask her out, so when she says, may I help you, of course, she doesn't know who I am. There was no video or anything like that. And she hears my voice, and I started out by singing to her. When you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. And I'm thinking, I'm melting her heart, and I'm saying, sweetheart, would you be willing to go out with me? And she's like, oh, you know, she's, she's, she's all Twitter-pated, I guess, you know. And so, so I drive up to the window, and as I get to the window, it was, a, it was a big window, and you could see into the bank, and I noticed that everyone in the bank was looking at me. Because unbeknownst to me, they didn't wear headphones, she didn't have earbuds. No, when the, when the uh, thing came in on the speaker, on the microphone, it was broadcast to the entire bank. And so I must have had 50 people waiting to hear her answer, which fortunately was yes. And the rest, as they say, is history. But we, we do a lot of things, a lot of, of crazy things for love, don't we? The thing is, here in the West, we have this concept of romantic love. And romantic love is an interesting thing because quite often romantic love is, uh, it's, it's not, it doesn't have staying power. Sometimes it's just a lie. You know, we talk about love a lot, but is it the kind of love that the Bible is talking about? I think of the, the couple, uh, the married couple who were known as the Captain and Tennille, a pop group. And they had the famous song back in the 70s uh, entitled, Love Will Keep Us Together. Guess what? It didn't. They ended up getting divorced eventually. But guys, the the encouraging thing is, is that God's love is really different from that romantic love that we have or any kind of love that we can produce. In fact, in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, it says, The Lord appeared to him from afar, and look what he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That is the love of God. We call it agape love. And it's a love that never ends. And one of the characteristics of this love, rather than being just as my pastor used to say, a ticklish feeling around the heart that you just can't quite scratch. Well, the the love of God is not just a feeling. In fact, it's a verb. It's an action word. I mean, when you look at John 3, 16, what does it say? God so loved the world that he gave. He did something. He, he, he had an action associated with that. In Romans 5, 8, we read that God demonstrates his love in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Another characteristic of the love of God, this agape love that, that he then passes on to us, is that we are then to pass it on to others, to give it away. In fact, I don't know if it's too soon to say this, but sort of like COVID-19, only it's a good virus. We are meant to go out and infect other people with the love of God wherever we go. Don't wear any masks for that. Let it just get right out there. I love the way John puts it in 1 John 4 when he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And it's a love that we pass on. Now, why am I sharing all this? Because in our passage today, in the book of 2 Corinthians, as we continue on in this study of being the church in the 21st century, as I mentioned last week, you know, even though we're not here physically in the building, I am, but you're not, but we're spread out all over the place, we are still the church because the church is not a building. The church is you and me. It's it's people. It's the people in the church. And so Paul is going to demonstrate this kind 
kind of love. And we're going to see essentially what the Apostle Paul himself is willing to do out of the love that he has for those in in the city of Corinth 2,000 years ago. If you have your Bibles, and I sure hope you do, turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Get out your notes that we provide for you on the app. There's also questions that our life groups will be using uh, throughout the week. Feel free to use that. In a, in a way, chapter 11, the, the passage we're in today, is a continuation of last week's message. And you remember how the Apostle Paul started this whole thing back in verse 1 of chapter 11. You can look at it right now if you got your Bible. He said this, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. You see, he's dealing with these false teachers, as we saw last week. And uh, these false teachers had infiltrated the church. They had, had come in with this false gospel. They were criticizing Paul, criticizing his ministry. And at the same time, they would talk. They would, they, would, they would build themselves up. They would talk about how great they were. They would talk about the wonderful experiences they had, the visions that they had uh, seen. They would talk about secret knowledge that only they had. They're making themselves indispensable you see, so that the church would then decide, okay, we got to pay these guys whatever they want and keep them here because they have the secret knowledge that we want. Well, Paul obviously has to counter this because this is all false teaching and it's leading the people astray. Now, obviously, he could have ignored what they said. He could have just, you know, I'll just preach the truth and let it stand for itself. I remember in high school, I was a band member, and there was a a poster on the wall of the band room, and it said, don't tell us how good you are, let your music speak for itself. Well, the Apostle Paul doesn't do that today. He's going to directly answer them. In fact, the Apostle Paul is actually going to boast about himself, albeit he's going to do it pretty uncomfortably, as we're going to even see in the text. And why does he do this? Why, I mean... For Paul, this boasting is going to be an obviously difficult thing for him to do. Why is he doing it? He's doing it because of his love for them. We saw last week in 2 Corinthians 11.4, it said this, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians. Even if they preach a different Jesus than the one that we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed in. And so you see, drastic measures are required here as far as the Apostle Paul is concerned. This is serious. These guys are leading his people astray. And so you could look at it this way. The Corinthians are Paul's world right now. And he wants to reach them. He wants to to, to speak to them. And if you're going to speak to somebody, you got to speak to them in a language that they're going to understand. And right now, for these guys, for the Corinthians, the language is somewhat worldly. It's somewhat fleshly. We've seen that as we've been going through the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians. So in order for them to truly hear what he is saying, the Apostle Paul is going to have to engage in a little bit of boasting, in a little bit of speech that he is very uncomfortable with. So let's look at what it is the Apostle Paul does for his love of these people. The first thing we see is that he was actually willing to be foolish. Look at verse 16. He says again, I say, let no one think me foolish, but if you do, then receive me even as foolish so that I also may boast a little. He's essentially saying here, I'm not a fool, but I'm going to act like a fool right now. I'm going to be a bit foolish in order to silence these guys who are accusing me, in order to silence these guys that are speaking foolishness. We're going we're to uh, match my foolishness up with their foolishness, and let's see just how they measure up. You know, in Proverbs 26, it talks about how to deal with fools. It says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will also be like him. Now, that's probably, the, the, most of the time, that's going to be the course that the Apostle Paul would take. It's the course that a lot of us take. If somebody's saying something outrageous or just obviously wrong, you accept that, okay, that's obviously wrong. I don't have to step in. I don't have to say anything. What's that old Shakespeare line? Methinks that thou dost protest too much. However, there's a second verse right after verse 26, or right after verse 4, I'm sorry. Verse 5 says this, answer a fool as his folly deserves that he not be wise in his own eyes. This is uh, the way Hebrew poetry goes. It often shows you two sides of an issue. So there are times when you just let it go. Don't, Don't worry about it. Don't bring more attention to it by even dealing with it. 
But then there are those other times when somebody says something. I've often said when we have sharing times in church and we pass the mic around, uh, I always pray on those Sundays that nobody says anything that is going to require me to step in. Because if somebody shares something that is heresy or, or offensive or whatever, as the pastor, I or Pastor Paul, we're going to have to step in and we're going to need to counter it right at that moment. And that's what the Apostle Paul realizes he needs to do right here. Now sometimes, uh, he's, he's, obviously, he admits that sometimes no answer is the godly thing. Verse 17, he says, what am I saying? I am not saying as the Lord would but as in foolishness, in this confidence of boasting. In other words, he's referencing here the, the obvious fact that when Jesus was being accused, what did he do? He didn't say anything. He didn't respond. He was silent before them. And so uh, he says, you know, I would rather do that, and that's, that's what the Lord did, but in this case, you know, it's not going to require that. It's going to require me speaking out. And again, look how hard it is. Verse 18. He says, since many boast according to the flesh, that's the false teachers, he says, I will boast also. For you, being so wise, tolerate the foolish gladly. He's speaking very much uh, sarcastically here, okay? <laughs> they are not wise. They're, they're, they're the opposite of wise. Uh, for you tolerate it if anyone enslaves you, anyone devours you, anyone takes advantage of you, anyone exalts himself, anyone hits you in the face. Now, what's he getting at? Well, first off, we realize from these descriptors that what the false teachers are doing is pretty serious stuff. They are boldly taking advantage of these people. When he says they, they are enslaving you, he's probably here referencing the fact that they are legalists. The Apostle Paul preached the gospel of grace, the fact that God has done this and, and nothing is required. It's not Jesus plus your good works, even though there's nothing wrong with good works, but good works are not a way to get to heaven. You don't have to be a good person. In fact, there are no good persons, so it's good we don't have to be good people because we, we're not good. But these guys were coming in and they were saying, you've got to do these things and you've got to behave this way and you've got to give money to me and you've got to, you know, th that's the kind of stuff they were doing. They were enslaving them. He says they devour you. In other words, they, they ate up in a sense that it's probably a reference to the fact that they were eating up the finances that the church had because they were charging for what they were doing. He says they take advantage of you. The word that's used there is the word that is used for a, a trap that you would trap an animal in. And why do animals get caught in traps because they don't see them because they're deceived they're just walking along and suddenly a trap and that's how they are they're being taken advantage of you're being deceived as we saw last week they exalt themselves in other words the false teachers focus on them not Jesus and then finally this is an interesting one it says they, they hit you in the face now, there's a couple ways this could be meant. It could be meant, uh, you know, figuratively, that they verbally hit you in the face. They embarrass you in front of everybody. There's a sense in which that's what it means. It's like a slap in the face. But do you realize that in those days, the rabbis actually had the right, if they felt it was necessary, to slap one of their followers in the face? So it could literally mean that they got slapped in the face by these false teachers. He goes on, verse 21, and now we really see his discomfort here. To my shame, I must say that we have been weak by comparison. He's, he's probably referencing the charge. You know, Paul doesn't behave the way we do because he's weak, because he's not a real teacher. He says, but in whatever respect anyone else is bold, catch this, I speak in foolishness. <laughs> I am just as bold myself. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. So these, we, we're beginning to get a sense of just what these false teachers were bragging about. They're bragging about how they were Hebrews. They had pure lineage. They were Israelites. They were the chosen people. They were, they were children of Abraham. And, and you know, by inference, what they're doing when they say those things is they're, they're suggesting that the apostle Paul isn't. Oh, but he was. In fact, Paul even shared with the Philippians some of, his, uh, some of his lineage. In Philippians 3, 4, we read, Paul's talking about himself here. He says, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. In other words, he's saying, I could put confidence in the flesh. Not that I do, but I could. I have the credentials for it. Look what he says. I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. 
So Paul had tremendous credentials. In fact, we know historically that he was trained by a very highly respected rabbi by the name of Gamaliel. And so nobody could really question uh, his bona fides, if you will, his credentials, both as a Jew and as an expert in the Hebrew scriptures. But again, Paul is saying here, I am willing to be foolish if that's what will reach you. If that's what will get you to begin to question what these guys are teaching. And so, out of his love for them, he starts to go down that road. And of course, that begs the question for us. Am I willing to be foolish? Am I willing to, to, to do whatever is necessary at times in, in terms of, you know, the effect that it might have on my ego or my comfort in order to reach the people in our worlds? Am I willing to learn their language, to speak in such a way, even though it might be uncomfortable for me, to speak in such a way that they're going to hear what I have to say? You know, here at Crosswinds, we have these cards. We call these the Your World cards. And we use these, we, we pray and we ask God to give us the names of the people in our worlds, those people that we work with, those people we go to school with, uh, those people that we meet daily, maybe the folks that, that work at the convenience store where I buy my gas. And then we actually list those names on this card and we, get, we begin to pray for them. We begin to pray specifically for opportunities to impact their lives. And then the thing is, when God gives us those opportunities, we need to step out. But I'll be honest with you, even as your pastor, sometimes it's kind of scary. Sometimes I'm not really sure what kind of reaction am I going to get from this person? How are they going to respond to me? Are they going to be offended? Are they going to be, you know, I was, uh, I, I saw a video a few years ago, and it was a video uh, produced, made by Penn Jillette. Now, Penn Jillette was a, a, a member of the uh, magician comedy duo Penn and Teller. They're magicians in uh, Las Vegas. And I've been to their show, and it's a great show. And afterwards, they come out into the lobby, and they spend as much time as necessary to talk to people individually. I've talked with, with uh, Penn, and I've talked with Teller. Teller actually speaks when you meet him face to face. And so I've had that. By the way, I should also tell you, Teller is not all that short. It's that Penn is that tall. Teller and I are about the same height, and I'm not a short person, but, but Penn is a huge guy. Well, anyway, that's a little digression. But Penn shared a video, and, and, and I should also say this, Penn is pretty well famous, pretty famous as a well-known atheist, and he's very vocal. In fact, he's got probably dozens of videos on YouTube where he talks about his atheism, and he criticizes Christianity and, and other faiths, and so he's very vocal, and he's a big guy, and he knows what he, what he thinks, and he's very quick with his answers, all that adds up to, he is an intimidating figure. And I don't get intimidated, at least verbally, by too many people, but he would be intimidating for me. There was a guy that had realized, uh, that I, I believe he realized that Penn Gillette was one of the people in his world. And he met with him after one of his shows and shared the gospel with him. And Penn Gillette talked about that. Let's watch this. I want to talk to you about this. I can hope in the show. And at the end of the show, as I've mentioned, we talked to folks and, you know, signed an occasional autograph. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the, um, what I call the hover position. He had been the, um, the guy who has, uh, picks the joke during our psychic comedian section of the show. And he walked over to me and he said, um, I was here last night at the show and, uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted. And he was very complimentary. And then he said, "I brought this for you." And he handed me a uh, Gideon Pocket Edition. He said, "I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this." And then he said, "I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy." And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. It was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell and you think that, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. But this guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane 
and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible. I know there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. But I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. Man, did you catch what he said? This is from an avowed atheist, a very famous, uh, uh, very vocal, scary atheist. And what did he say? How much do you have to hate somebody that if you think that they're going to go to hell, I'm paraphrasing here, if you think they're going to go to hell and you're not willing to tell them about that, you're not willing to try to reach them. And, and, and I, I share that because, you know, that had to be a completely unexpected response. I'm sure that, uh, and by the way, we know who the guy is. His name is Tom Behrens. Uh, and, uh, yep, same name as me. And uh, he was the guy that actually shared with him. And I, I don't doubt that there was a little bit of uh, reticence, a little bit of, you know, I, I'm not sure how to approach this, but I'm just going to do it. And guys, that's the kind of love that we need to have. Even, even risk being foolish to the people in our worlds that we think they're just not going to be open. Well, why not give it a chance? You say, how do I do that? We, we use the ABCs quite often around here. It just means that you, you share with them you know, the, the fact that you need to admit that you are in this position that you're in, the position of not being uh, among God's people, that you are lost without Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the, the default position, as I said a few weeks ago. And that the wages of sin is death. And that means you're separated. And so people have to begin by just admitting that, yeah, that's where I'm at. I have nothing to do with God. If, if somebody doesn't admit they have a problem, then there can't be any help. I, I was watching a video uh, a few days ago, and it was this video of these massive waves that were coming in. And there was this one video where this guy was in the water, and behind him, you see this wave just welling up and the person on the beach is saying hey 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 and the guy in the water was like hi how are you <laughs> and and so as this wave is welling up there's he, nothing is happening to him why because he has no ability yet to admit that there's a wave behind him now of course if she told him there's a wave behind him and he says I don't believe it then you've got an issue there but that's the first step and then the B stands for believe. You see, Jesus came and lived that perfect life. And so he wasn't under the sentence of death like the rest of us who are having to pay those wages. So when Jesus died and was buried and rose again on the third day, he wasn't doing all that for himself. He was doing it for us. He was a substitute for us. And God accepts that substitute. And it's not just something that's automatic. That's what the C is. The C says, I have to make a choice. I have to confess with my mouth, as the Bible says, that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in my heart that he has been raised from the dead. And those are the kinds of things that we need to be bold at times or maybe even be, you know, a little bit scared or, or foolish, you know, feeling. But, but get out there and just do it. Just give it a shot and just see what happens. Well, that's what the Apostle Paul was doing. He was speaking to them. He was giving them truth, fully realizing that a lot of them thought this was foolishness and that uh, the, the false teachers were calling what he was doing foolishness. Nevertheless, he kept it up, all because of his love for them. The second thing we see him doing, uh, in addition to willing, being willing to be foolish, is to endure suffering. And man, that is an understatement when you think about it. Look at what he says here. Verse 23, he says, are they, the false teachers, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane, okay? I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Ashes. I want to stop right there and just talk about that for a minute. This past Good Friday, uh, for the first time since the movie came out, I watched again The Passion of the Christ. And I got to tell you, I was blown away by the, the, the scenes that depicted Jesus Christ scourging, where he went under the lash, the 39 lashes. And, and it just blew me away, the amount of, of blood and bruises and cuts. It was a movie that was intensely researched, and so they came up with, this is what it would look like. I was actually going to put a picture up for you, but I thought better of it. It's usually when my wife says, you shouldn't have done that, because it is that gruesome. All right? That's Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul here is saying, I went through that five times. 
That is almost a miracle because the fact is, historically, we know that quite often people died from the lashing. They died from the scourging. Paul went through that five times because of his love for the people that God had sent him to. Look at verse 25. He continues. It doesn't end there. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. You hear this and you begin to think, or at least I, I begin to realize why his critics said some of the things about him. Pastor Paul shared with us a couple of weeks ago in 2 Corinthians 10. He said, look what they said about him. His letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. Well, I can understand. I mean, you hear this kind of stuff, you realize it's a wonder, you know, no wonder his personal presence. Can you imagine what he must have looked like? And I'm, I'm amazed that he was able to speak at all after these kinds of beatings. And it doesn't end there. He, he, he continues, verse 26. I have been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, cold, and exposure. Man, <laughs> I got to tell you, this is pretty humbling for someone like me to hear. I, I, I'm often, you know, throughout the year, uh, I usually get a couple of opportunities every year, sometimes more, uh, to go out and speak in other places or to, or to be a camp speaker or to, or to give a, a, an address in some place. And, uh, you know, I, like the Apostle Paul, I do it for free. I don't charge people. If they, if they choose to uh, support me, that's fine, but I, it's, not, it's not something I ask for. But I will say this, almost without fail, they, they pay for my transportation. They, they will put me up in a hotel. They'll feed me some pretty good food. And then beyond all of that, I'm really appreciated. I'm well taken care of. I'm introduced as the Reverend William Barons. And, and, and so I get all of this, the, these, these accolades and all of this good treatment. And then I look at what the Apostle Paul went through. And I tell you, it's pretty humbling. I, I look at my own life and I think, you know, if I miss lunch, then by the time I get home at night, I'm telling my wife, I'm starving. And here the Apostle Paul probably literally was starving. If my schedule isn't kept, you know, you know I've talked many times about how I am not a patient man, all right? There are times if things aren't going on my schedule, if things don't happen, I start getting, well, I mean, I look at what the Apostle Paul put up with. Certainly, I don't think any of this was on his schedule, and yet he continued on. You know, COVID-19 is tough. The things that we're going through is difficult. And, and, and again, as, as Paul said this week, you know, we're not at all in any way trying to minimize that. But come on, guys, as tough as it is, it ain't like this that, that he's going through. Uh, you know, this kind of treatment, though, even though we we're talking about something that happened 2,000 years ago, I, I want to encourage you with the fact that this is not just a history lesson. These kinds of things are still happening today. In fact, organizations that deal with, with Christian martyrdom tell us that there are far more martyrs in the world today than there ever have been in history. Of course, in the first century, we hear about the Christians being fed to lions and being skewered on poles and sawed in half. But the amount of martyrdom and murder of Christians is, is astronomical these days. In fact, uh, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association had this uh, quote about, uh, about that. He says here, last year, meaning 2019, this is literally last year, he says 215 million Christians experienced high or extreme levels of persecution in the 50 countries where it's most difficult to be a Christ follower. Christians are facing imprisonment, beatings, abductions, rape, torture, forced marriages, and death. I looked up on the uh, website for Open Doors, which is a persecuted church ministry. And again, they say last year, uh, over, nearly 3,000 Christians were murdered for their faith. Martyred, as we say. Nearly, nearly 10,000 churches and other Christian buildings and organizations were attacked, destroyed. Nearly 4,000 believers were detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, executed, or imprisoned. And, and with all of this, you know, and, and again, it's, it's continuing to go on. There are Christians that continue to suffer willingly, it seems. 
And Paul's suffering, we, we need to add, and he adds, was not only an external suffering, not only a physical suffering. Look at verse 28. He says, apart from these external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? We talked about it last week. The apostle Paul likened himself to a father to them. Think about that, dads. As tough as things get financially, as tough as things get physically, even during these times when we're sheltering at home and when we're having to have social distancing and and we're, we're dealing with these physical and mental and emotional things, even with all of that, nothing compares to my concern for my kids, right? I mean, if something's going on with my kids, I don't care what else is going on in my life, that runs to the top of the list. The only thing that might even be greater, but it's not greater, it's just right up there, would be my wife, okay? Those kind of concerns. And that's what the Apostle Paul is getting at here. He's saying this is just tearing me up on the inside. What you guys are going through, what, what, what you're allowing to have happen to you through these false teachers. So why? You gotta ask the question, why would he do this? In fact, let's, let's even go a little further. Why would he do this for people that really oftentimes didn't treat him very well? I mean, these are people that this church was founded by Paul. You realize he gave them a good foundation. They drifted away after Paul had started them off well. And so in many ways, these guys are kind of enemies. Well, they're definitely enemies of Paul if they're siding with the false teachers. And trust me, a good number of them were. They were right up there with the false teachers. And so I I do things for my kids, for my family, but what about the body of Christ in general? Not only the good ones, but the pendulettes, if you will, in the body of Christ. I see, I don't mean in the sense of his atheism, but just in the sense of maybe his personality and his antagonism. I see three reasons that the Apostle Paul uh, probably dealt with this and put up with this. At least three, uh, there's probably more. But here's what the Apostle Paul, I think, knew, and it guided, it, 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 it determined how he was going to proceed in his ministry. The first thing is that heaven and hell for the Apostle Paul were very real places. You were, if, if we get out of this, you know, if we get through this life, then there is heaven waiting for us if we know Jesus Christ. If we don't get through this life, or if we get through this life and we don't have Jesus, then hell awaits us. And those are very real things. And I have the opportunity to, to enable someone to go to the one place or end up in the other. And so I think Paul's attitude was, let them beat me, let them stone me, let them imprison me no matter what. No matter what they do to me, I'm going to keep ministering because, and in fact, in Paul's case, heaven was waiting. He even said that at one point. You know, if uh, yeah, I I desire to to go, to depart, to be with the Lord because I know heaven is waiting. But if it's His will, then I'm going to stay right here and continue to do what I'm doing. The second reason is this: the gospel is powerful, and Paul knew that. We saw it last week. Romans 1.16 says that it is the power of God unto salvation. And no matter how people behave now, no matter how ornery they are right now, no matter how pendulatous they may be, okay, this message, this gospel will change them. And for the opportunity to see that happen, for the opportunity to have a hand in changing someone's life that way, I will endure whatever they throw at me. And the third reason I think the Apostle Paul endured this was because he personally experienced God's mercy. Paul himself had been one of those guys. He had been a persecutor of the church. And we're going to look at that in a minute. But God reached out to him. Almost, it would seem almost against his will. And and so Paul realizes there but for the grace of God go I. And I need to reach out to others. And and probably all of us, to some degree or another, have those kinds of stories. I look at the people and I think, you know, why would they behave that way? Why would they act that way? Why would they allow themselves uh, to, to, to live that kind of lifestyle? And then I have to quickly, you know, remember, oh, that was me at one point. I was there too. And yet look what God has done for me. And so, guys, it really is all about our focus, if you think about it. If I, if I focus on the reality of heaven and hell, if I focus on the, the power of the gospel to change people's lives, if I focus on the mercy that God had for me, then guess what? I will be far more apt to go for it. 
You know, they, they talk about in any great endeavor, you, you measure the risk against the rewards. Well, I got to tell you guys, when you're talking heaven and hell, the, the risk, uh, the, the rewards, I should say, far outweigh the risks in this situation. And so, like the Apostle Paul, I often say, I'd love to be able to say I do it 100% of the time, but I still struggle. But I often say, you know what? I will then endure whatever I have to endure in order to see another person saved for eternity. Another person in my world going to heaven along with me. Focus is the key. Where is your focus today? It's pretty easy right now for our focus to be on the struggles we're having. When we talk about, you know, the unemployment rate at being at the highest ever recorded. Uh, you know, we're higher now than the Great Depression from the 1930s. It's pretty easy to focus on those kinds of things. And, and I'm not saying we don't focus on them. You know, we have to have our focus in, in certain areas. We have responsibilities and, and that's okay. But there should also be a focus on the people in my world. There should also be a focus on the reality that they are facing. I heard a story one time about a guy driving down the street. And he drove by a house. And the house on this street's roof was on fire. And and he stopped the car. And he looked into the house. And he could see the lights on. And this happy family sitting around the table. And they were laughing together. And they were playing a game. Now what do you think the guy said? Do you think that he, he even entertained the thought of, you know what? Those people are having such a good time. And if I go up to the door and and, and knock and tell them that their roof is on fire, it's just going to ruin their family night. I don't think that was ever a consideration in this guy's mind. No, I mean, you know what he did. He ran to the door. He banged on the door. He wanted them to know your roof is on fire. Guys, that's what the gospel can do for you. It gives you that kind of focus. When you see the, the reality of what people are facing, it, let me tell you, it's far worse than their roof being on fire. I was at a camp one time uh, with one of our mission teams, and we had a staff area where the staff all uh, camped out, and, um, and I was the driver. I drove the buses and the, and the heavy equipment, and so I was driving a moving van in to move in some stuff uh, for the staff, And in the middle of this staff area, a lot of us staff, we had our children there. And there was this little five-year-old girl, and she was sitting right in the middle, right where my my truck was coming, but she was way further than I was ever going to be able to hit her. I was going to stop way before her, because that's where I was going to deliver this stuff. Nevertheless, as I'm driving in, her mother, who had been doing something on the other side, turned around, and all her mother saw was her daughter in the road and this moving van coming towards her. What do you think she did? Do you think there was ever a thought in her mind that, you know, if I run out there, I could get hit by that truck? No, she was out there. Why? Because that was her focus. That was the number one thought on her mind. And guys, we need to develop some of that focus that we see here in the Apostle Paul. His focus was on his love for the church. He was willing to be foolish. He was willing to endure, man, tremendous suffering. And there's one more thing we see, and that is the Apostle Paul, with all of his credentials, with all that he could have bragged about and did brag about, as we see, he nevertheless swallowed his pride. Look at verse 30. He says, if I have to boast, (laughs) again, that's another example of how uncomfortable he is. It's like, if all that I've said isn't enough, if the fact that I've been willing to suffer for you and that I'm willing to be foolish for you isn't enough, then, then I'll continue. If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. Now, we've seen this. Paul had exceptional credentials. He was probably a genius. I mean, think about it. We're still talking about him. We're still reading his stuff 2,000 years later in, in, the, in the, uh, the, the, the historically number one book of all time. And so think about that. Who are these false teachers? <laughs> what did they write? What did they come up with? We know nothing about them. So the apostle Paul, we still know about. And yet he says here, I'm going to put all of this aside in order to focus on something greater. I'm going to focus on something, he says, that highlights my weakness. Look at verse 31. He says, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Artus, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascusines in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hands. Now, I would encourage you, go, go to Acts chapter 9, and you can read about this event. 
We see in Acts chapter 9 the conversion of the Apostle Paul. It's when he was on his way to Damascus. He was on his way to persecute Christians. He was going to grab them up in chains. He was going to take them for, possibly, well, for trial and, and ultimately even probably for execution for some of them. And yet on that road to Damascus, the Lord confronted him, knocked him to the ground, blinded him. He went on to Damascus, and then the Lord told a, a, a Jew by the name of Ananias to go and minister to Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> and Ananias had questions about that. What, Lord? Are you sure? He, he says, this is the guy that's been persecuting us. This is the guy that's been hauling us off to jail. It, it would be sort of like God telling a Jew to go and talk to Hitler, or, or God telling a Christian even today to go and minister and, and share the gospel with a member of ISIS, okay? That's what it was for this guy. And yet, uh, you know, the Lord said this to Ananias in Acts 9.15. He says, go, for he, Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Kind of an aside, but you realize here that one of the reasons Paul went through all this suffering is that's exactly what God called him to do. That's, that's God's call on Paul's life. He is going to be there to suffer. He's, that part of it is to suffer for the Lord. Well, Paul here, though, but what we do also see, it says that he will bear my name before the Gentiles. Now, now think about that. Here is the Apostle Paul who had a passion for the Jews. In fact, in, in uh, Romans chapter 9, Paul even says at one point, I love my people, the people of, of, the, uh, of the Israelites, the people of the Jewish race, the, the people of Abraham. I love them so much that if it were possible, I would give up my own salvation to see them come to know Christ. And so there's that love that he has for them. Besides that, he was trained. He, was, he knew the scriptures forward and backward. He was so well suited for this ministry. I mean, if I were God, thank goodness I'm not, but if I were him, I would think, what better person to be the minister to the Jews? Ultimately, we know historically that it was Peter that was known as the, the apostle to the Jews. Paul became the apostle to the Gentiles. Nevertheless, in, ja in Acts chapter 9, we see that Paul, as soon as he regained his sight and got a little bit of learning, he began preaching to the Jews. And it says even there that he began to prove to them from Scripture that Jesus was the Christ, was the Messiah. What was the result? They weren't convinced. They didn't want to hear. Well, and then we know that he went off and spent three years kind of in seminary with Jesus himself. We'll actually talk about this next week. It's the next uh, section in chapter 12. And then he goes back and he starts preaching to them. And what's the result now? They want to kill him. Okay, so he's not doing so well with these people that he loves so much. And so what did the people who did love Paul by that time, what did they do? In order to save Paul, they famously, it's one of the famous uh, uh, points of Paul's life, they let him down in a basket through a hole in the wall so that he could run away with his tail between his legs. It was a humiliation. And here's the apostle Paul saying, this is what I want to boast about. This is like the crowning thing. You think of all the things the Apostle Paul did, and he's saying, the thing to me that is the most important that I want you to, to remember me for is that I was let down in a basket outside the wall, running away from my pursuers. And why would he boast about this? Well, because Paul, you see, knew what he wanted. He knew that he wanted to go to his people. He wanted to reach the Jews. However, he also knew by this time that, Paul, that God had called him to the Gentiles. And he knows that true satisfaction is found in doing what God wants. Hopefully it agrees with us, but even if it doesn't. And guys, again, this is a lot of what we're going to see next week. But let me just give you a little bit of a, of a preview of next week. Paul talks about this thorn that he has that, that, that is, is bugging him. It's some kind of a, a malady, some kind of an affliction, could be a, a spiritual oppression. It's been considered many things. But he has this thorn and he wants to get rid of it. And so he prays and, and we pick up the narrative in verse 8. He says, concerning this, his thorn, he says, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul says, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with the weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties with Christ, uh, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
You see, if Paul uh, ju- just dealt with what those things that made him powerful, then who, who knows what we'd be preaching today? We'd be talking about how wonderful Paul is. But instead, Paul says, no, I want to focus on my weaknesses because then the, the focus is going to be where it needs to be for these people that I minister to. It's going to be on God. So here's Paul, and, and he says, the greatest glory in my life was when I thought that doors would open and I would be able to reach out to the people that I want to reach to, and instead, they slammed shut. They tried to kill me. I wasn't able to have an impact there. Well, guess what? God, you know, you be praised. I'm going to go your direction. And guys, a lot of us do the same thing, don't we? I mean, ministry-wise, I, I, I may think, you know, I want to be used by God. I, I have something that I want to do. This, Lord, you know, I've prepared myself. I've gone to school. I'm, I, I'm, I'm suited to these people. Maybe you want to be a worship leader or a pastor or a youth minister or, or a missionary. And, and it, it's not unusual for people to get into that and, and they plug away and they plug away and finally, you know, they, they, it's just not happening. And in a sense, just like the Apostle Paul was let down, as, as the scripture says, you're let down. You're not getting what you wanted. Maybe it's not even ministry. Maybe it's just that life right now has let me down. I had plans. I had goals. Uh, I uh, I had a business. I had an income. And now in the last eight weeks, all of that is gone. That's kind of a letdown, much more so than even a basket outside the wall. And so what would the Apostle Paul say to us this morning? He'd say, don't worry. You know, that day, I, I, what, I, what I was denied, when I was denied, I, and I thought, you know, I, I got let down in that basket, and I thought that was such a humiliating experience, it ended up becoming the most important turning point in my life. God used that. I can agree with Paul. Beyond my, my uh, salvation, the most important uh, event in my life was about 10 years into my walk with Christ. And I was up in front of my church one Sunday morning, and I, and I, I need you to know, I lived my life with the, with the understanding that everything that had to do with my faith, my walk with God, was my responsibility. And so I worked hard. I served round the clock. My wife sometimes didn't see me for a day or two because I was so busy working for the Lord because I wanted to be, you know, I, I wanted to do everything he wanted for me. I had good intentions, but I had it all wrong. It wasn't me working for the Lord. It was the Lord working in and through me. I had no concept of the power that he wanted to give me. Instead, Instead, I was using my own power, and one Sunday night, or one Sunday morning, as I was actually singing a song, you know, I'm known for that, and I opened my mouth and nothing came out. And at that point, God just said, that's it, Willie, You're, enough with you doing it in your own strength, I want to teach you something new. And it became, for the next couple of weeks, the most humiliating point of my life. I began to feel like, you know, should I even go on? Not that I was suicidal, but I mean, I thought, you know, I'll just go back to driving a truck. I'll just go back to, you know, doing something else because obviously, you know, I'm no good to the Lord anymore. And I ended up discovering that I was far more useful to the Lord because now I was humbled. Now I, you know, my my pride had, had washed away because I didn't think I could do anything. And everything I did from that point on was an act of the Lord's power working in me and through me. And it's been far more effective than that first 10 years. Even though I will say this, in case you're one of my old youth group members, the the stuff that God did in those first 10 years was significant as well. God has a lot of grace. And he even works through, uh, through flawed instruments like many of us are at some times. So that's what the Apostle Paul has for us today. Let me give you a couple of takeaways, and then we're going to be done. The first one that I have this morning is this. What is keeping me from reaching out to my world? The Apostle Paul, again, he he was willing to be foolish in order to reach out to his world. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're just afraid. Maybe you're, you're, you know, a big reason is that people are afraid of how they're going to look. You know, what, what are they going to think about me? And so is that keeping me from doing that? What should I do about that? Think about the things we've talked about today. Another question I ask myself is what kind of things do I tend to focus upon? I think this passage really emphasizes the fact that if I keep my focus on the Lord, that's going to fuel my passion. 
If my focus begins to become diffused or I start looking at other things, my passion for the Lord is going to go the same way. So I want to keep my focus there. That's the essence of our, of our mission here at Crosswinds Church. We grow in Christ and we go to our worlds. Our focus is Jesus Christ. We grow in him and out of that focus comes a passion not only for God, but a passion for the things that God is passionate about, which is the people in this world that he sent me to. And then the third one is this, what is the greatest event in my life? What is the thing that, as I've shared with you, you know my answer. First, off, first and foremost, it was my salvation. But secondly, it was that point in my life when I decided I truly am going to follow you, Lord. No holds barred, nothing held back. I'm going, if you say it, Lord, I'm doing it. Have you come to that point in your life? He desperately wants you there. He wants you to experience life lived full on, uh, all out, no, no holding back for the Lord Jesus Christ. People do crazy things for love. And my point here this morning is this. If I say I love Jesus, then guys, let's get insane for Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us today. What an encouraging uh, life the Apostle Paul led. But Father, that shouldn't blind us to the fact that it was a tre tremendously difficult life. And yet I do believe that even though we hear some of the things that the Apostle Paul went through and how awful that must have been, I, I am confident based on even other things we see the Apostle Paul say and even things he said here today, that Father, there was, a, there, there was a, an aspect of life, there was a quality of life that those who don't know what it's like to follow you, to be foolish for you, to, to put our pride aside, to yes, even suffer for you, don't have any uh, inkling of just what a quality of life comes out of that. So, Father, give us uh, bravery. Give us the ability to, to step out of our comfort zones in those times when we have opportunities to share with the people in our worlds and to proclaim your name. And, Lord, we will give you the glory, the honor the, for all that is accomplished through that. We want to be your tools. We want to be your crazy, insane followers. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Crosswinds, we believe this vision of growing and going can change your life and the world around you. Crosswinds Church is a nonprofit, which means it operates from gifts given from people just like you. When you give, your money goes to creating opportunities for people to grow and go all over the world. I would love for you to be a part of that. And you can give a gift right now by clicking on the Give button in the top right corner of this page, or you can go to cwcmv.org slash give. Join us and join what God is doing through this vision of growing and going, and have a great day.